Good morning, church family. How are we doing? Good. Yeah? Hey, more, co- more coming in? This is good. It's like Sunday morning, you know, you just start and then, you know, you, by the time you preach, everybody's here. So, um, hope you rested well last night. Um, I did, and uh, hope your heart is encouraged. If you were here last evening, just with our, just our challenge to love Jesus more, um, and really that's, uh, that's what God's after for all of us, isn't it? Um, that he is after our affections. He actually wants us to love him. Um, and I think that's one of those um, glorious truths that I, I would actually say sets biblical Christianity apart from the rest of the world religions. Love for Christ. We're not moralists. We're not duty-oriented or duty-bound. We actually have love for Jesus. And then he, he's constantly stoking our affections, right? He's stirring our affections that we would love him more and love him better. Um, and just like some of y'all who've been married for decades, um, if your marriage hopefully is healthy by God's grace, um, at least this is what everybody tells me, the longer you're married, the sweeter it gets, right? And, you, and sometimes you're like, how does that work? I mean, doesn't that same person get boring? Um, you know, at least that's how the world might think about it. You've been together 30, 40, 50 years. Isn't it old news by now? Not, not if you're walking with Christ, not if you're loving and serving each other. It just gets better over time. Um, and I think as we walk with Christ, uh, we see that, right? Our love for Christ increases. So, um, well, this morning, by way of introduction, um, I'm always challenged by doing workshops, conferences like this for a few reasons. But one of them is we all have limited capacities. Um, I have a limited capacity. You have a limited capacity. And after some point, hearing a bunch of sermons and talks from the Word of God, we're, we're kind of spiritually something like you might feel after Thanksgiving dinner. You're just like, I'm done. Like, I can't, I can't take anymore. <laughs> I've hit max capacity. As much as I might want another bite, I have to stop eating. Um, and so I want to be careful today, really all day long, to just not give data dumps, if you will. Um, but I'm going to try to bring every sermon down to just one central truth. Um, one central truth, maybe you could jot it down, um, meditate on it later if you're that kind of person. Um, and my hope is that we'll come away with maybe one or two life-changing truths. And I don't mean like, wow, my life was changed on Saturday. But I mean just truths that God would plant in your soul, and, and you would say, my, that, that truth really helped me learn to walk with God better in this area of missional living. I mean, after all, I, I think that's how the Spirit normally works, at least in my life. Um, it's not a whole sermon. It's not a whole book. It's not even a chapter Sometimes it's just that little statement, that one line from a verse that just jumps out and you're like, oh, Lord, that's what I needed, right? I needed that. Um, and so I'm hoping that today there'll be something that sticks, something that convicts, not just for a moment, but actually for change. Um, and so, it, and you know, it's funny how the Spirit of God works. It might not even be my main point. It might be something else that you go, oh man, that's exactly what I needed, all right? And so just jot that down, and if we come away just a little bit more like Christ when it comes to living on mission, then that's a win, right? That's a win. That's a success um, in the eyes of God. Again, because our spiritual growth, remember, it's not, a, it's not a sprint. I love how the Bible uses words like walk. It's just this walk with God, this journey with God, and hopefully we're growing and getting better and better all the time at it. Um, and like we talked about last night, um, God is patient, amen? So we, we actually are harder on ourselves than I believe God is on us. Um, he knows, I mean, I love you this morning, but he knows that we're losers. <laughs> he knows that we're failures. He knows that we're going to struggle to live the life of faith. And that's the good news of the gospel. He still loves us, right? So we're not earning our keep with God. Yes, we live the life of faith. Yes, we strive for the obedience of faith. But the Lord in heaven, he's not like, oh, Justin, you did it again. I can't believe it. It's like, no, no, I I know you did. That's why I saved you. It's why you need the gospel. So even as we talk today, my goal, I honestly, honestly, saints, my goal is not to beat you up. I think it was maybe even your pastor when I was being trained in seminary, who said something that just stuck with me. He said, you know, a good sermon is not when you're beat up. It's when you're lifted up to see Christ, right? And that's that's, that's my hope, is that we come away today just, wow, Christ is glorious. Christ is worthy. Let's live better for him in a world that doesn't. And so last night, our takeaway, if you were here, was missional living is the result of loving Jesus. I mean, that was just a central truth, loving Jesus. And so maybe that's where God already began convicting you. You realized, yeah, I don't live on mission because my love for Christ lacks. 
I, I have a whole bunch of other things I love more than Jesus, and I'm more comfortable talking about those things than Jesus. And we looked at three stories, well, actually the end of three stories, where people love Jesus and it produced action uh, because love actually moves us to do something, right? I mean, that's just classic, you know, marriage counseling 101. If you love your spouse, you should serve your spouse, right? Love compels action. Same thing. We love Christ. It compels us to action. It compels us to killing sin. It also compels us to love others with the gospel. And so this morning, don't forget that. Don't move past that. Love for Christ because of Christ motivates everything. Um, and like I've just, I'm going to kind of restate this, God forbid that you're shamed or guilt-tripped into missional living. Now I want to say this carefully, because should we obey God when we don't feel like it? The answer is yes. You can shake your head yes. We obey God when we don't feel like it, all right? However, however, I don't believe that we should guilt-trip each other or shame each other into obedience, because God sees the heart and he's not impressed. He's not impressed when we're obeying him, when we actually are kicking and screaming inside. Our hearts are in rebellion. Jesus actually said things like, quoting Isaiah, you honor me with your lips, but what? Your heart's far from me, right? So that's not the goal. The goal is not, hey, if we, if we get this talk or if we get, what we're, if we get missional living, um, we'll, 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 we'll share the gospel with five people because I have to. If I don't, I'm in trouble. That's not, that's not what God's after. He cares about our hearts. He always cares about the hearts behind our actions. And so don't move past the all-important truth that we should do all things in love. And if you're born again, you've been given a new heart, and you're actually now able to love God from the heart. That's the whole point of the new heart. You're no longer hard to God. You're soft. And you actually want to love Him and please Him. And yet... And yet, and this is where we're going to go this morning for this first talk, our love for Jesus should be coupled with a robust knowledge of Jesus. So affection for Jesus is the motivation, and yet, yet affection should be paired with a thorough, a thorough knowledge of the glorious gospel of Christ. All right, so affection is the motivation, but affection moves us to this thorough knowledge of Christ. And I'm going to call this gospel fluency. All right, so I'm going to use that phrase today, gospel fluency. It's not, it's, the phrase isn't original to me, but I like what it communicates because we all understand what it means to be fluent in something. We typically use the word fluent to speak about, to talk about languages. Some of you in here are bilingual or trilingual. You're fluent in multiple languages. Um, I have family members who in the 80s went to Brazil to be missionaries. Two of my uncles and a whole bunch of my cousins, uh, they've lived there for 35 plus years. Uh, and they learned, they studied hard to learn Portuguese. And I remember, I remember them telling us that they, they felt fluent when they began to dream in Portuguese. That was a win. It was like, oh, I dreamt in it. I wasn't just thinking, okay, English to Portuguese, Portuguese to English. I began to actually dream in this new language that I'm learning. To be fluent, according to Webster's Dictionary, is to express, is, is the, the ability to express oneself easily and articu articulately. That's what fluency just generally means, the ability to express oneself easily and articulately. And so for our time together this morning, really throughout the day, I'm going to unpack a few key components of gospel fluency. Because I do believe, church, that, that all of us who have been redeemed by the gospel, we should be fluent in the gospel. We should be fluent in the gospel. The gospel should not be fuzzy. I mean, one of the saddest things to me about American Christianity is if you just ask, what is the gospel? It's like, ah, oh, I don't know, ah, oh, the whole Bible. It's like, what a cop out, right? That's not, I mean, that's, it's true, it's in the Bible, and it's true that the entire Bible story could be called gospel, but that, that's not really it, right? And we're, we're fuzzy on the gospel. But we should be able to express ourselves easily and articulately when it comes to gospel truths. After all, it's the most important message in the world. It is the singular thing that reconciles sinners to God. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. So praise God we believe the gospel, but we shouldn't just stop there. It shouldn't just be, well, I don't know. I mean, I go to church and, and I read my Bible and, and I don't know. That's all I know about my faith. No, we should be gospel fluent people. When I think about fluency, I think about culture. I mean, some of you, some of you, you live this. So for me, it's just hearsay. But from what I gather, it's hard to actually be a part of a culture until you learn the language, right? 
There's just things you're going to miss. At least that's what everybody tells me. That you, you go to a foreign country, and you might live there for decades, but if you never learn the culture, if you never learn the language, you're not really going to assimilate to the culture. There's going to be jokes you always miss, right? Things you don't pick up on, because you're not fluent. And when we think about gospel fluency, what we're actually saying is the gospel should permeate our culture. It should be just part of who we are, shaping everything about us. This idea of gospel fluency is more than just, oh yeah, I memorized the gospel, or I learned a, a Romans Road presentation of the gospel, but it should be the culture in which we live. And far too often when Christians talk about the gospel, we're, we sound more like a high schooler practicing Spanish one. We're barely getting out of the, I think that's a verb stage, right? Maybe that's an article. And if we're going to live missionally, brothers and sisters, if we're going to be used by God to make disciples of those who don't yet know him, we need to be gospel fluent. If there's any subject matter that you could devote your life to, it would be the gospel. It would be digging deeper and deeper into knowing the gospel. Again, far too often, Christians know what we might call the gospel ABCs. You might have even learned it that way. And don't get me wrong, that's a great place to start. The problem is we stay there, right? So this, there's a, there's the, if you just kind of, if you boil down the gospel, you might say, well, I know that Jesus died and he rose again from the grave. Uh, for the forgiveness of sins. And he ascended back into heaven. Praise God. That, that's, that's beautiful. And you might even say that I know, I know that you must believe in him to be forgiven and have life eternal. And that's a good place to start. But the gospel, saints, is deep and it is wide. I mean, I think of things like the Hubble Space Telescope. There's some new one. What's the new one? Whatever. There's some massive new billion dollar telescope in space right now. But I'll just use Hubble since we all know that one. It's like looking into deep space and you think you've exhausted it just to find something else. We never exhaust the gospel. For all eternity, we will never exhaust this glorious gospel. And so when we, when we lean back on some prepackaged way to share the gospel, instead of being gospel fluent, we're actually kind of just familiar with our gospel sales pitch. We've got this one gospel sales pitch that we've memorized, and we think that that's fluency. Similar to that Spanish one student who just memorizes a few key words for a test. And that's as far as we ever go. Um, the problem with that is that if you think the gospel is more like that sales pitch, the moment you get off your sales pitch, you're lost. You're not fluent. You can't have a conversation about the gospel. And, and when, we, when we look at Jesus, we're actually going to see that he did not have a one-size-fits-all gospel approach. He is as varied as as many people are in the world. The message never changes but how he interacts with people is vastly different because he was fluent in the gospel. And so we're going to go back to look at Jesus in the gospel of John. Um, obviously, Jesus is the master teacher, right? If anybody was gospel fluent, it was Christ. He lived the gospel. He spoke the gospel. And he was able in any and all circumstances to bring this gospel out to the, to the right person in the right situation every time. And frankly, that's kind of where I want to be. I mean, I know that it's not going to happen this side of heaven. Not perfectly anyway, but I do believe that we, we have the Spirit of God in us, correct? We've been given the Word of God, correct? So we can live godly lives in Christ Jesus, and that includes how we share our faith with those around us. And so this morning, if you're writing down things or they're in your notes, and again, I'm sorry, Don asked for my titles and themes, and I think I changed all of them, so my fault, not hers. Um, there's just one central idea this morning, and it's this. Missional living demands gospel fluency. Missional living demands gospel fluency. And, and I, I want to press this home, and I want to encourage and equip you, hopefully, to be more fluent in the gospel. Or maybe you'll just begin to see, wow, I thought I was gospel fluent, but I wasn't. And the reason I'm tongue-tied is not because I don't love Jesus, but because I really haven't studied the gospel. Not like I thought I had. I've been kind of staying at a surface level of the gospel. And so missional living demands gospel fluency. So let's dive in and look at a few things. The first thing I want to show you um, from a variety of passages in John is this. Gospel fluency demands theological depth. Now, I'm not going to get lost in the deep end of the pool this morning, but gospel fluency demands theological depth. And the sad truth today is the gospel has been truncated. We've shortened the gospel. Um, I like to compare it this way. We've made the gospel like this French reduction sauce. Have you ever I mean, had French food? They just boil the sauce down, down, down until it's like a paste and they smear it on your food. 
We've made the gospel that, 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 let's boil it down, boil it down, boil it down. What's the lowest common gospel denominator? Instead of the gospel being this ocean of beauty and depth, it's become a thimble that's barely able to quench the chi- a child's thirst. And, and then we, we think that that is the gospel. And don't get me wrong, the gospel is simple. Children can believe it. But the gospel is also deep and wide and vast, and we should know the depths of the gospel to the best of our ability this side of heaven. So let's just look at a few things um, under this idea of the gospel, gospel fluency and theological depth. We need to graciously declare that Jesus is the one and only way to God. Do you realize that's theological depth? It's not just exclusivity, the exclusivity of Christ. It's deep. Let's just think about some of the ways Jesus would say this. Let's, uh, if you have a Bible or an app, John 5.18. We're going to be mostly in the Gospel of John and hopefully just kind of learn from Christ in this way. In John 5, verse 18, the Word of God says this. This, is, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself what? Equal to God. You know, there's a whole bunch of interesting and maybe even simplistic ideas as to why the Jews killed Jesus, but this is it. He made himself equal to God. And when he made himself equal to God, they said, no, 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 no. We have one God. His name is Yahweh, and you're not him. How dare you? Anybody who makes themselves equal to God, they should, be, they should suffer the penalty of death. So Jesus, in doing this, he's saying, hey, because remember the Jews, they believe there's one God, Deuteronomy 6. There's one and one God only. And there's no imposters. There's no seconds. There's only one. And here Jesus shows up and says, hey, I'm, God's my father. And they knew what that meant. I'm God. And they want to kill him for it. See, they're not playing games with this other God, this second God. The Jews are like, no, no, no. When any, when any Jew shows up as a false prophet or claiming to be a, a God, we, we know what to do with them. We want to kill him. But Jesus is declaring his deity. Or if you go forward to John 10, verse 9, a few more pages over, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. This is emphatic. This is a definite article. I am the door. What's that mean? There's no other doors. There's not like, well, door A is a good option. Door B is okay. Door, door C, well, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's second, third best, but it still gets you there. That's not what Jesus is saying. I I am the door. I am the door, and anyone who enters by me will be saved. Anyone. Jew, Greek, whoever. But there's only one door, and it's Christ. See, Jesus, even in his day, he's not playing games with cultural relativity. He's not tolerant of all religions, meaning we're all the same. Nope, nope, theological accuracy, theological depth, there's one, and one only. And his name is Christ. And then the, the kind of the granddaddy text that most people know is John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am what? The way. And I am the truth. And I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. You see, these, these verses might roll off of our tongue. Or you might say, yeah, well, well, Pastor Justin, I know those. Yeah, but think about it from the sense of sharing your faith. This is actually, this, this really is the deep end of the theological pool. I mean, this is actually saying to somebody, yeah, I know that there's literally millions of global religions and global gods, but there's only one who's true. And we're not going to play this game of, well, we're all kind of going down the same path, and one day we'll all get to the top of the mountain somehow. There's one way to get to God, one way to be reconciled to the Creator, one way to have your sins forgiven, one way to escape eternal wrath, one way to be counted worthy, one way to be made righteous. And so we are convictional at this point, brothers and sisters, at least we should be. We're not smug, we're not proud, we're not hostile, we're not trying to win arguments, but we're convictional. You know, the words of Martin Luther, I can do no other. This is it. This is it. Christ alone. There's no other way. And so I think when we think about this category of gospel fluency, I think we should be clear here. Followers of Jesus, we're not tolerant like the world uses the word tolerant. Because by tolerance, right, all roads lead to God. And we know that's a lie based on the words of Christ. 
Followers of Jesus, though, saints, we should be loving because love offers all people the truth. Love doesn't say, yeah, I know you're, I know you're, um, I know you're about to get run over by a train, but just go ahead and stay there. Yeah, love doesn't say, well, I know the bridge is out, but keep driving. That's not what love does. Love yells, stop. Love tackles a person off the train tracks. Love drags them kicking and screaming. Love says, you're headed for eternal perdition. Let me stop you. Let me, be ev- let me give you every warning to not go there. That's what love does. And so love declares before it's too late that Jesus is the only way. So we don't water down the gospel. We lift up the true gospel and we let God do his work. So gospel fluency, theological depth, Jesus is the only way. Another thing that I think we need to look at is in John chapter 3. John 3 is central. We're going to be there a few times today. Um, Because again, like I mentioned last night, I believe it's the most in-depth gospel presentation Jesus gives. Now, there's others that he gives that that are just as wonderful, but John 3 is pretty special, and it's special for some good reasons. And here we see Jesus in his, in his gospel fluency and theological depth. He's going really deep, really fast. And I think this is good for us today because according to, you know, best experts today when it comes to evangelism, if you've ever gone, done any training in evangelism today by kind of global leaders in evangelistic thinking, again, they boil it down to be very, 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 very simple. I mean, almost so simple that it's, it's too simple. Like, if you just sign this card, if you just pray this prayer, if you just believe this, you're in. Oh, and then by the way, since you prayed that prayer, you can't go to hell. So you got this thing called eternal security in your back pocket, and we're all good. And that's not the gospel. We've simplified it far too much. Look at what Jesus does in John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus did not tell Nicodemus to simply accept me into your heart. He didn't even tell Nicodemus to go to church. He didn't say, hey, get saved now, get serious later. He said, all right, Nicodemus, you want to have this talk? Here we go. And and this is, we're going to talk about this more later today. But Nicodemus just kind of shows up and gives some bumbling, you know, hey, Jesus, we know you're a teacher from God. Like, hey, Jesus, you need me to affirm you. And Jesus is like, cut to the chase you got to be born again. Jesus immediately jumped right to this deep, uh, the deep waters, if you will, of, of uh, the gospel. And remember, it's an evangelistic conversation. Evangelism 101, according to Jesus, if we were to take Jesus' example is, you got to be born again. That's how Jesus presents the gospel. I mean, talk about, ah, really, Jesus, wasn't there a better way? Couldn't you have, like, made that easier to understand for Nicodemus? Couldn't you have, like, tried to come in the back door a little bit smoother than, hey, bro, be born again? Jesus' strategy, though, was to never water down the gospel, but to make it explicitly clear what you need and what the gospel will cost you. You see, what Jesus is doing to Nicodemus is nobody can change themselves. That's the gospel. Nobody can change themselves. No amount of self-reform will get you into the kingdom of heaven. No amount of good works will save you. No amount of church going will do the, will do the job. No amount, or in Nicodemus's case, of Torah reading or synagogue going will get you in. There's nothing the sinner can do to change the hard heart. That's the gospel. You can't change yourself. Now, what we're not saying is, well, you know what? You just better pray that God would save you because you can, no, no, we do believe it. You want to be saved, repent and believe. All right, so we're not saying that some passive, well, you know, unless God does a work, I can't get saved. That's not how the Bible portrays it. We're going to still call sinners to repent. And you know, we know those who are born again because you know what they immediately do? They repent and believe. So we call sinners to repent and believe. Jesus is simply telling Nicodemus, there's nothing you can do to inherit eternal life. You see, through repentance and faith, the heart is made new and that's the ultimate problem. All people need a divine heart transplant. Right? Ezekiel 36, 26. What's the prophecy in this new covenant? I'm going to give you what? A new heart. Your heart of stone is going to be replaced with a heart of flesh. You'll actually want the things of God. 
You see, the problem, and this is what we do so often today, and, and I don't mean necessarily maybe your local church, but I just speak of broader Christianity. What we often do is we make the gospel about God meeting our felt needs. Oh, you're, you're in a bad relationship? God will fix it. You're, you have a problem in your, in, your, in, your, in your finances? God will take care of it. Oh, you have a problem with your boss? Come to Jesus. He'll solve it. We make the gospel about these felt needs. Or maybe even worse, we make the gospel about being a better version of you. Like, you could be a better version of who you already are, just bring Jesus along for the ride. And we're missing the point. The gospel is about God taking a heart of stone and making it a heart of flesh. The gospel is about this radical transformation from hating God and being entirely insensitive to the things of God to actually loving God and wanting to please him from your heart. So when we, when we preach the gospel like Jesus, we shouldn't water it down to the lowest common denominator. There's times where you need to tell somebody, well, what does it mean to be a Christian? It means that God gives you a new heart. And as we'll see later today, we're not going to go there just yet. Nicodemus is like, What? I am so confused right now, and that's actually okay. When we share the gospel with those who don't know him, we should expect them to be confused because their heart is still dead in their sins. They're still lost. So we're not like, oh, man, I blew it. They're confused. No, Jesus didn't blow it. He's given the gospel, and Nicodemus is thoroughly confused. So... Gospel fluency demands or requires theological depth. And, and, you know, I would actually commend you if you're a reader, and if you're not, maybe you should be, um, because reading is good for our souls. Um, But just look up some sermons by men like Charles Spurgeon or George Whitfield or Martin Lloyd-Jones, and look up sermons on the gospel, how they preach the gospel. Because 100, 200 years ago, they were deeper than we are today. And you'll read a sermon. I mean, I I did a paper on Whitfield, and I remember reading his sermons to the lost. I'm like, dang, that's a seminary class. I mean, literally, that's what we call seminary today. He's he's preaching the gospel to the lost. And he's telling them about, you got to be born again. And he's going, he's diving deep into regeneration. I don't like, maybe, maybe he got it more than I do. Maybe he understood that Jesus's model was go after this new heart. And so when we think about gospel fluency, we need to be willing and able to dig into the deep things of the gospel. Now, church, again, I'm going I'm to repeat myself a lot because I think we learn by repetition. Um, we're, I'm not saying that until you master these deep things of the gospel, because you never will, that you, you can't evangelize. All right? So sometimes like, oh, my goodness, I don't know enough. Okay, I won't say anything. No, no, no. Remember last night? Love Christ. Open your mouth, speak of him. But as you do that... God's going to press you with opportunity where you're going to realize, I didn't know the gospel as well as I thought I did. Great. You know what to do. Dig in. Know the gospel. And say, Lord, just keep teaching me. Keep teaching me. You know what's amazing about that? When you dig in to know the gospel, you know what God's also doing? He's warming your affections for Christ. So now your love for Christ is growing, which motivates your living on mission, and you're actually better able to talk about Jesus because you know him better. Right? So again, for some of you, talking about, you know, a football team is just second nature. You know stats, you know names, you know records. Why? Because you've studied it. It's easy for you. So it is with talking about the gospel. Dig into it, and then God will give you opportunity to share Christ in ways that you're going to be like, wow, praise God that I've been digging into the gospel. I'm actually able to talk about the things that God, uh, that, that, that I think the Bible requires when sharing my faith. So gospel fluency, theological depth. Number two, under this kind of overarching theme of missional living and gospel fluency, is gospel fluency requires addressing sin. It requires addressing sin. We have got to go after sin. And here we're going to look at John chapter 4, primarily. Yeah, I think this one's just John 4. In John chapter 4, again, a story that I'm going to hit on throughout, well, last night and and today, we have Jesus dealing with this woman of Samaria, the woman at the well. And Jesus here, in a masterful way, he offers hope, get this, as he goes after sin. You see, what we've done today is we've created this idea that, well, if I really love somebody, I can't talk about sin, right? If I really, if I'm going to be hopeful, 
excuse me, I can't talk about sin. That would discourage them. And I don't want to discourage them, so we're just going to ignore the sin piece. And I would actually just, you know, as we kind of get into this point, um, I would say this is maybe the most neglected doctrine in the gospel today, the reality of sin. We, we love to talk about Jesus as Savior. We love to talk about Jesus loves you. We love to talk about how he died on the cross. And so it's like we're dancing around the gospel, but we're actually never willing to get to, the, to why do you need him? Because without the reality of sin, you don't need him. Right? One of my favorite illustrations is when people say, I'm saved. I'm like, okay, saved from what? And if you don't know the answer to that, you're not saved. I mean, if you're drowning and somebody saves you, it's a pretty, they saved you from drowning. You were going to die. So if all we have is, oh, Jesus is Savior. Great. What did he save you from? Well, the wrath of God. Because I'm a sinner and I deserved his judgment. I'm, I'm a sinner and I deserve judgment. And I was saved from that. And so Jesus offers hope here, but he also, as, as he goes after sin, look at John 4, verse 4, 14. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman says to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty. You have to come here to draw water. All right, she's still confused. All right, so again, be encouraged. Jesus giving the gospel, the people hearing it are confused. He's all talking about living water. He's offering hope, and she's like, sweet. I'm tired of walking to this well. If you're going to let me drink water, then I'll never have to come to this well again. Hallelujah. That will make my quality of life better. Felt needs, right? That's, that's what we do. Jesus, meet my felt needs. And she's not getting it yet. She's still thinking carnal. She's not thinking spiritual. And so Jesus, you know, uh, sometimes I think in evangelism, we want a smooth segue. Oh, what's the smoothest way to get from point A to point B? That's one of, my, that's one of the lies I believe. Oh, I just don't know how to smoothly transition. Jesus is not smooth at all. Because you don't need to be. Look at what he does. And Jesus, she says, give me this water that will never come here again. And Jesus says, yeah, go call your husband. The woman says, I have no husband. Jesus says to her, you're right in saying I have no husband. For you've had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you said is true. Wow. He's like, mic drop. Crickets. You just see the, the like, you know, her eyes are going to get this big. Oh, my goodness. He, 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 just, he just went there. We were just talking about water and wells. And now he's, he's confronting my adultery? Whoa, time out. Again, the lie today is that when we talk about the gospel, we only talk about God's love or God's mercy or God's grace or God's goodness. And the lie is that if we just make God look good enough, everyone will want him. Like somehow we can make God more attractive than he already is. And we think we do that by leaving out his attributes of holiness and justice and wrath because it exposes our sinfulness. You see, the hope of the gospel is only hopeful against the backdrop of our sinfulness. We have to be convinced that we are hopeless to need the hope of Christ. When you evangelize various religious people, and we'll talk about this more later today, like there's entire religious systems. Actually, I would say most of the religious systems of the world don't believe that man is sinful. How we occasionally make mistakes. But if you've ever, if you've ever uh, been involved with... Um, evangelizing Mormons, let's say, and you start bringing up the reality of sin. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, I'm a pretty good person. I mean, I occasionally make a mistake, but I mean, that's occasionally. There's no, there's no need for the hope of the gospel because they're not really broken by their sin. And in order for, for this woman to actually come to a place of embracing Jesus, she has to see that she's hopeless, not for just water from a well, not just because she's thirsty physically, but because she's thirsty spiritually. And Jesus has to, he has to get her to the place where she sees her spiritual thirst. And that's by bringing up the reality of sin. And so Jesus, again, in such a masterful way, offers hope and immediately addresses the reality of sin. And, and hear this, this is an act of love and mercy on the part of Jesus to bring up sin. It's actually merciful. It's actually gracious. It's actually loving. Because unless she sees her sinfulness and the exceeding great nature of that sinfulness before the holy God of heaven, she'll actually never turn to Christ to be her hope. 
She'll still be hoping in these earthly things. Because to be honest, we could probably conclude she's been hoping in relationships that aren't working. Do people do that today? Yes, absolutely. Let's just go from relationship to relationship to relationship. Maybe this one will be better. Maybe this will provide the hope that I'm looking for. And so Jesus brings up the reality of her sinfulness because then she could turn to the one true God who alone provides the hope that all people need. So brothers and sisters, like I mentioned, I I think this is the most neglected doctrine of the gospel today. And we love to talk about what I call the warm and fuzzy feel-good doctrines. Just turn on the radio. Christian radio just makes me sick. It's all they talk about, the warm and fuzzy doctrines. And I'm just like, but why do we need him? So So he makes you feel positive and encouraging. Great. But why do we need him? We need him because we have a sin problem. And so, brothers and sisters, I think we should, we, we should be clear here that loving, we should love people enough to kindly and graciously tell them that we all have a sin problem. And Jesus is ready and willing to forgive all who call upon him. You see, forgiveness, again, we'll use things like forgiveness, but we'll never actually talk about sin. No, no, what are you forgiven of? Come on. Sin, thank you. You can talk back to me. Okay, it's not always rhetorical. You can, you can, you can, we can interact a bit. Yeah, we're forgiven of sin, so we go after sin. Oh, now I'm convinced that I actually need forgiveness. You see, this is why I call this the, the, the deep end of the theological pool, because nobody talks about sin. Religion doesn't talk about sin. Faith and spirituality doesn't talk about sin. It just makes, makes me feel good about myself right? And we're going to talk about this more later today, that we live in a world that's spiritual, but it's all just make me feel good spirituality. Make me think positive thoughts about myself. That's not the gospel. The gospel is actually brutally honest, but in that it's so kind. Because I believe at the heart of man, we know we have a sin problem. We medicate it, we, 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 we try to shove it away with materialism and, and busyness. We bounce from relationship to relationship. We abuse drugs because of it. We don't want to deal with the problem of our heart. And yet God's like, no, 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 here's the point. Your heart is wicked, and I'm willing to forgive you. Really? Yeah, yeah, I love you that much. I sent my son to die for you. But we can't ignore the reality that we are broken in sin before a holy God. So Jesus goes after the reality of sin, even as he offers hope. But I want to show you one more example. I think you have time for this. Let's go till 10. All right, sweet. We got time. Um, There's one more example of this in John chapter 8. Flip over there. And uh, if you have questions about whether or not this should be in the text, go talk to Chris. Um, Because it maybe has brackets in your Bible and there's some comment about the Masoretic text and, you know, not sure if it's there, but it's here, so we're going to talk about it, okay? Um, there's, here we're going to see Jesus condemning self-righteousness as he still goes after sin, all right? So the woman at the well, she's not necessarily self-righteous. She's just broken in sin and wanting to duck and dodge. But here we have another example of Jesus sharing the gospel and confronting self-righteousness because actually self-righteousness, spiritual pride, is still sin, and it needs to be confronted. So here we have this story in John chapter 8, beginning in verse, I guess it's uh, 1 or previously 53 of chapter 7, going down through verse 11. And this, this, it's this story of a woman caught in, caught in adultery. It's interesting that these religious leaders, these Pharisees, they bring this woman caught in adultery, and as a side note, the man's not mentioned. Because we all know adultery takes two people. Somehow he gets off, she's before, the, before Christ. And like the scribes and Pharisees are always doing, they're wanting to trap Jesus. All right, so every, every time you see scribes and Pharisees going to Jesus, they're trying to trick him. They're trying to trap him, all right? It's a, it's a cat and mouse game. Hey, can we get this guy to say something stupid? Can we get him to disagree with the law of Moses? Because we really want to get him, all right? So they're not, they're not in goodwill coming, hey, Jesus, what do you think about this? No, they're, they're trying to come after him. They're trying to catch him in what might be called a theological fumble. And if you remember the story, they bring this woman, and Jesus says, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. 
And in this moment, Jesus isn't condoning her sin, but he's condemning the hypocrisy of her, her accusers. And so I think even in John 8, when Jesus calls out the sin of the Pharisees, it's an act of mercy. Because these scribes and Pharisees, they thought, oh, we're righteous. We keep the law, right? We're, we're the good guys. She's the bad one. She's the bad apple. She's the one that needs to be dealt with harshly. And so Jesus confronts sin even in that moment. He's condemning their hypocrisy and their self-righteousness because these men are riddled with it. They are moralists. They're externalists. They're religious men. But Jesus knows their hearts are far from him, so he doesn't play their game. Frankly, I think this is alive and well today. We live in a society that we love to judge other people. I mean, of course, we say we're tolerant and all that, but no, there, there's bad people, and typically bad people are just the ones that are a little worse than me, right? Because I'm the standard, you're the standard, and these ones are bad. They're the bad apples, if you will. In this confrontation, Jesus, Jesus doesn't coddle the woman in her sin. He doesn't ignore her sin, but he calls it out with these words. Look at what he says in verse 11. He says to the woman, neither do I condemn you, and go from, go from now on and sin no more. The woman is a sinner. The woman's a sinner, we know that. Okay? And if she repents and believes in Christ as her Lord and Savior, is she still going to sin? The answer is yes. Do you still sin? Yes. All right, we're on the same page here. So Christ isn't telling her to go be perfect, for only Jesus is perfect. What he's saying is, all right, and I think that the tenses of the, the verbs here help us, stop sinning in the way you are. You're living in hard-hearted, unrepentant wickedness. Stop it. Stop going down that road. Stop practicing the sin of sexual immorality as a way of life. Turn to me and live a life by faith before God. Stop going down that path. And so here Jesus, again, masterfully, in this narrative, he calls out both sets of sinners. He calls out the religious sinners who think that, hey, we're good. I mean, we, we obey the Torah, we go to synagogue, we're leaders in Israel, we're good. He calls out their sin, and then he calls out the woman caught in adultery. And he says, hey, hey, stop it. Your sin's deserving of judgment. Go and sin no more. Stop doing what you're doing. By faith, believe in me. Jesus said this all the time. He would close evangelistic conversations with those words. Go and sin no more. Not because he was demanding some moralistic perfection, but he was calling them to the life of faith. Stop living in your hard-heartedness away from me and learn to follow me by faith. Stop making a practice of sin. <sighs> Brothers and sisters, we have got to be clear here, gospel fluent people will always deal with sin. You can't share the gospel without talking about sin. Period. End of story. You've shared some sort of feel good, God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life, but you miss the gospel. You see, every, people really aren't that offended by the statement, Jesus loves you. That's not the offense of the gospel. They're, they might not even be offended when Jesus died for you. They might say, that's weird. Why would he do that? But okay, whatever, he died for me, all right. That, that's all, that's still, you're still staying on the surface of what makes people feel good. And it's all true. It's all part of the gospel. But if you take out the reality of human sinfulness, the gospel's lost its sting. Because is, is the gospel an offense? It is. The gospel's called an offense. And the offense of the gospel is this. You're broken. I mean, I, I had a man bring a friend to me. This is two college students. One's a believer, one's not. The one who's not a believer, he's a mess. And, and he knew he was a mess, all right? He is frat partied it out. I mean, he is wasted all the time. He's, he is just, he is messing up his entire life. And he knows it. He's, he's got anxiety and fear problems. I mean, this poor kid's a mess. So he agrees to come and talk to me uh, with his friend. So we sit down and I just, hey man, tell me your story. And it was just, I mean, I was able to share the gospel really beginning to end with this guy. I mean, just who God is, who he is, his sin problem, his, the need for Jesus, the hope he could have in Jesus. And it, we finish and, you know, again, in my pride, I might be thinking, man, I just killed it. <laughs> Praise God. I mean, I just shared everything with this guy. You know what he said? 
I don't want to believe that about myself. I was like, well, I think you got it. You have to be willing to say that's, I'm a sinner before a holy God. You're not just making occasional bad choices. You're running from God because you don't want to submit to him. He didn't repent. Who knows what God will do with that gospel seed? But I think that's actually, if God taught me in that conversation, I need to help people get there. I need to help people come to the place where they at least know there's a God and I've sinned against him and I continually sin against him. Now they may say, I don't want to believe that about myself. Okay. Okay, you may not want to, but you've got to get to that point before you'll ever turn to him to be saved. And so gospel fluency requires going after sin. And then finally, gospel fluency requires um, or demands biblical faith. We've got to, so we're thinking about theological depth, missional living, gospel fluency, going deep and hard after the gospel. And again, we can't be satisfied for these simplistic answers. All right, I grew up in a, in a strain of Christianity, and I believe they were well-intentioned, okay? So I'm not throwing shade on how I grew up. I believe they were well-intentioned. But I mean, I think I got saved every day for years <laughs> because I was always afraid that I didn't pray the right prayer. I was afraid that, oh, I, I really screwed up again? Okay, I'll pray again. I'll get saved again. And so I have no idea which one worked. <laughs> but I really don't care. I know that I love Christ. I know he saved me, all right? But the way I grew up, it was, it was very decisionistic. It was, all right, I have to believe. Okay, I believe. Oh, but today I don't believe. Okay, tomorrow I'm doing good. I mean, it was just, I was a mess until I came to understand the nature of saving faith. And I think we have to be clear on what faith is, because faith is one of those nebulous words. Every, every religion talks about faith. Even today, oh, I'm a, I'm a person of faith. And then we just stop there. I mean, we, we don't want to ask faith in what, right? I mean, you can go to AA and be a person of faith. You just make up whatever version of God you want to believe in, and you have your higher power. But, so we're all cool with faith, but what do you mean by faith? What do we mean by belief? And as you would expect, Jesus doesn't leave it vague. He makes it very clear. So the problem is that we have reduced faith to be something that's barely more than mental assent. All right. That's what I think that is the problem. We, we really believe that if someone just affirms belief in the Judeo Christian version of God, they must be a Christian. And then the, the, the classic, well, who am I to judge? I mean, I mean, you claim to be a Christian. Okay. I'll just let you be because you say you have faith. And Jesus unpacks this idea of faith and belief all over John's gospel. And I believe it's far more robust and thorough than mere mental assent. Um, I've been preaching through John's gospel for a while now. Um, I'm hoping to finish it up this year. If one thing has hit me over and over and over and over again, it's Jesus defining faith. He does it in so many ways. And he doesn't leave it with just this simplistic, hey, believe. Oh, well, okay, you believe. We're good. No, he's going to press the issue and define it in a way that I think we need to have such clarity today. Because one of the things that I think Jesus presses is this. According to Jesus, faith is life on God's terms. I mean, you might want to jot that down. That, that's actually been helpful for me. Faith is life on God's terms. And I would actually say that that's where the Christian life begins. When you submit to the gospel for the first time, guess what you're doing? You're no longer doing life on your terms. You're doing life on whose terms? God's terms. And guess what the entire Christian life is all about? Life on God's terms. I'm reading my Bible. God says this. All right, now faith is I can either go my own way or I can submit to God's way. That's called faith, isn't it? I mean, this gets real practical real quick. This is a whole other sermon in itself, so I can't geek out too much here. But I mean, when I want to be angry at my children, it's faith that says, no, a soft answer turns away wrath. But they deserve it. But a soft answer turns away wrath. But God, Justin, okay, Lord, I'll submit to you. I'll do it your way. Faith, if I, if I, if I walk with God, faith just won the day. I did life on God's terms. That's, what we, that's the whole Christian path. And so here, I think Jesus, when he, he's giving the gospel over and over and over, what he's saying is, hey, faith is life on my terms. You've got to be willing to submit and surrender to me. Stop doing it your own way 
and live for me. Do it my way. So let's just, let me just break this down a little bit. You might be like, I don't know, that sounds maybe a little bit legalistic or a little bit, well, let me just walk through and let's see if maybe the word of God will convince you. Let me just, we're going to throw out six or eight references here. John chapter 1, verse 12. Jesus, in the very prologue of John's gospel, verses 1 to 18, chap, verse 12, he says this, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. To have faith is to receive him. And I believe to receive, biblically defined, is to accept God on his terms. You received him. And this would be like, hey, you get a phone call. Somebody in your family just died, and they left you a million dollars. But here's the terms. Like, ah, that's, those terms are a little bit annoying. I mean, I got to drive to L.A. or fly down to L.A. to sign some papers. Hey, you know what? Can you guys just change the terms? I want to do it on my terms. Can, you, can somebody come to my house instead? That'd be a lot more convenient. Well, sorry. If you, this is the terms. You either do it this way or you don't get the money. Um, yeah, you'd be kind of an idiot to not just buy a flight, go to L.A., and, and do it on their terms and get the money. You received something, but it was on their terms. You see, when we talk about receiving the gospel, it's God's terms. He sets the terms, not us. So we, I think this idea of receiving is a really helpful way of saying, yeah, we received Christ, but it's on his terms. You don't set the terms. You don't define the gospel. He does. To have faith is to receive Christ. Well, then we could just turn forward a few verses to a famous verse. For God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave his only son. God loves the world. God gave his son. It's all God. He's done it all. That whoever believes in him, believes in, in what? This God who loves the world and gave his son. Gave his son what? To be a sacrificial payment, to be a wrath-satisfying payment, to pay the price we deserve payment. He gave his son. Believe in him. See, to, whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. See, this, I think here, John 3, 16, helps us to understand even what believe means. And if we, we will go on later today, actually, and look more closely at John 3 to understand the story of Nicodemus. And we actually get down to verse 19, 20, and 21, and we get into how this belief is called, or actually puts us in the category of light. We're no longer in darkness, right? And so to believe is to actually be moved to action, to now live in the light. We're no longer living in darkness. We're living in light. Why? Because we believed, Again, believing is never, ever defined as mental assent, just agreement. Oh, yeah, it sounds good. Sure, I'll vote for Jesus. That's not it. We're not just giving some mental affirmation to Jesus. It's faith that moves to action. If you look at John 1, verse 43, this is actually all over John's gospel. But verse 43, to have faith is to follow. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. I actually think this is how we should talk about the gospel. Just follow me. Are you ready to follow Jesus? Because again, we, we've made it all about, well, I just don't want to go to hell. All right, like John Piper says, the fear of hell is a great motivation that scares you in the right direction. But if all you do is want fire insurance, you're not coming to Jesus on his terms. Now, Jesus talked a lot about hell. Because the reality of eternal damnation, that's serious. But we're not just getting out of hell. We're following Christ. And so Jesus just, oh, I think this is how Jesus calling his disciples is actually how Jesus calls followers today. Follow me. Follow me. And if you don't want to follow him, you have no faith. At least not saving faith. You might, again, you might have Jesus in your back pocket. You might go to an evangelical Christian church every day of your life for the entirety of your life. But if your faith doesn't mean follow Christ, it's not saving faith. Because Christ was clear, follow me. And I think as we talk about faith with those who don't know Jesus, this is a great way to talk about it. What's it mean to be a Christian? You really want to know? It means following Jesus. I thought it was all by grace. It is. It is. It is. You're saved by grace through faith in him, and you're saved unto good works for the glory of God. Follow Jesus. It begins with repenting and believing. 
And guess what? It continues with repenting and believing. It's all by grace. It's all by grace, but you must follow Jesus. That's confusing. I know. Remember Nicodemus? He was confused too. But don't redefine faith just to make it more palatable to your mind. Follow me. I love John 1.18. To have faith is to know. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. There's a key, this word know and known is key to the entire gospel of John and how John defines, or how Jesus defines faith. And I've been very comforted in studying this word through the gospel of John because biblical faith is to know him. See, I think one of the lies that is being spread in our society is, and I think it's, it's, it's always been there, but I think it's ramping up more and more, is that faith is foolishness. People that have faith are like, like putting an ostrich who sticks its head in the sand. You're just dumb. If you were smart, you wouldn't believe. If you, had a, if you were intellectual, you wouldn't have faith. You wouldn't need it. And actually, as we study Jesus, Jesus is going to press over and over that we can know him. And I believe that God, in his brilliance, is using this language of knowing because God who created all of this, he gave us minds that we might use them to know him. Not to check our brains at the door. And I honestly, I think a lot of false religion does this. Hey, don't think too hard about it. And that's one of the tools of Satan. He blinds the minds of unbelievers. Have you ever studied false religions and actually felt bad for people? I do. I don't mean this to be pejorative or digging on other religions, but I study false religions, and I literally am brokenhearted. I'm like, this is the biggest load of garbage I've ever read. I mean, this just makes no sense. It's not logical. It's not historical. It is just lie upon lie upon lie. And yet people are believing it by the millions. And you see 2 Corinthians 4, the God of this world blinds the minds of unbelievers. And, and I don't think we're, uh, brother, hear me carefully, we're not exceptionally smart. We're not like, oh yeah, we found it on our own. No. But there is a God. He is true. You can know him. You can engage your mind. You can ask hard questions. And he's, he's able to meet that every time. And so Jesus defines faith as you can know him. It's not ignorant faith. It's not foolish faith. It's truly knowing him. So faith is to know. Let me, let me keep going here. We'll wrap it up in just a second. John 3, verse 21. But whoever does what is true comes to the light. That's a definition of faith. You do what is true. You've come to the light. See, authentic, authentic faith looks like obedience. It looks like something you're doing. I mean, just a classic and great illustration that's just so easy for us to remember is you're sitting in a chair. When you walked up to your chair, did you check all four legs? I don't know. Is this thing going to hold me? What's the weight limit on this thing? It's been around for a while. It might break. See, if you just looked at the chair, we'd say, well, why are you sitting down? Well, I, you know, I believe in it. I'm just not sure it'll hold me. Um, no, you don't believe in it. If you, if you believed in it, you would sit down. Right? So you're like, I don't want that one. It's only got one leg. Well, then I'm not going to sit in it because it's, it's going to be rickety. But your faith goes, oh, I'm going to sit in a chair. Oh, look at there. It worked. You see, faith is action. It moves you to something. And this idea that I have faith that does nothing to change my life is not faith. Because Jesus here, you do what is true. That's what faith looks like. It compels you to action every time. So faith is doing what is true. How about John 8, 31? I mean, we can just go all day. We'll probably do this one and be done. John 8, 31. Because to have faith, according to John 8, 31, and a variety of other texts in the Gospel of John, to have faith is to abide in my word. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Wow. He didn't just say, hey, if you show up at church every Sunday, you're in the club. And if you give 10%, you're even better. It's not what he's doing. Hey, hey, get busy serving as an usher with kids ministry, then you're in. That's all fine. We can serve. We can go. Boy, you abide in my word. And we all know what it means to abide. It's, it's where you live. It's the whole sphere of your existence. 
You abide in my word? Ah, you're my disciples. What's Jesus doing? He's defining faith. Faith looks like abiding. So I think we, again, we're talking about evangelism. This isn't just to the church, even though it's good for us. When we define faith, we've got to have clear God definitions of faith. We're not using some watered-down, weak sauce definition of faith. We're using clear God definitions. I mean, I'm not going to read these texts, but there's more. John 5, 24, to have faith is to hear my word. You're defined as a person who continually hears his word. And we know that hearing in Scripture, to actually hear, is to hear with the, with the uh, desire to do. It's like when God hears our prayers, He's hearing to do, hearing to act. To have faith in John 6, 37, is faith is to come to Christ. This acknowledgement of need and desire and want, you come to Him. John 6, 40, to have faith is to look on the Son. Just confident, constant looking on the Son. Brothers and sisters, to, if we're going to share Christ and be gospel fluent, we must define faith according to Jesus. And I believe a great little phrase is faith according to Jesus is life on God's terms. The gospel declares that you have been doing life on your terms since the moment of your birth. That's what sin is. Sin is life on your terms. And you must repent and believe, and you must begin doing life on God's terms. That is called faith. And so gospel fluency requires defining faith like Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I started off at the beginning with, you know, the gospel is like exploring deep space with the Hubble telescope. When you think you've seen it all, another image more glorious than the next comes into focus. And so this morning, we just scraped the surface of a few gospel realities. And we could go on and on about things like imputed righteousness, adoption as children of God, reconciled to God, Jesus as the wrath-satisfying payment for all sin, being forgiven as far as the east is from the west. These are all gospel truths that we should be able to know and rehearse in our own souls. And we're never going to exhaust the depths of the gospel But brothers and sisters, we can be fluent in the gospel, not perfectly, but adequately to speak of Christ. And that's God's desire, is that we could know the gospel well enough so that it would both fuel our affections, but also enable us to open our mouths and speak of him. And so church, hear this carefully. If you've been converted, if you've been been given this new heart, you are fluent enough to live on mission. Remember the woman at the well? Come and see the one who told me. I don't even know who he is yet, but I know this. He told me all I ever did. So if you've been born again, you can speak of Christ. You're not exempt from living on mission until you reach some threshold of maturity or fluency in the gospel. But that should be no excuse for us to press deeper and deeper into knowing the gospel. We might be gospel fluent because if we're going to be faithful ambassadors for the king, if we're going to be ministers of reconciliation, if we're going to live on mission, then I believe it's just incumbent upon us to be fluent in the gospel. Would you agree? That we could be fluent in the gospel so that we're able to express ourselves easily and articulately whenever it comes to gospel truths. 